Hello my friends, welcome back to my channel. Okay, so I am very excited about this video today that I'm gonna be filming for you. I saw Samantha from Books with Samantha. She did a video like this called Recent Historicals She'd Been Loving, and I actually have been wanting to do this video too for a while. I was gonna like narrow it down to like my most recent five-star historical romances, but I've really kind of struggled a little bit both with like wanting to read historicals I hate to even say that because I love historical romance, and finding ones that I really, really loved. So these are ones that I have read since one of them was in December. I have five books. All of them are five stars or higher. I do sometimes, two of these are six star reads for me. You're probably, if you've watched my content, you know which ones I'm talking about, but we're going to talk about them anyway. So make sure you check out Samantha's channel. She's the biggest sweetheart and just honestly, she's a delight. She's a freaking delight. And uh, yeah, make sure you check her out if you like if you, if you just like sunny personalities and um, romance book recommendations. If you're not already, you probably are. So anyways, let's go ahead and get into it. So the first book that I want to recommend is, of course, my most recent favorite. I've already, I've logged about this. I've talked about it a lot on Instagram, and I did a post with this book. It's Forever Your Rogue by Erin Langston. This is, in my opinion, one of the most stunning historical romances I've read in a really, really long time. I absolutely love the characters in here. I think their characterization is so on point. I love the setup, the plot. It's made to have very high stakes, and so then everything about the romance also feels very high stakes, so it never feels like the actions the characters are making feel like over the top or unrealistic because you know the stakes are so high. And not just because the author tells you that they're high, but because you are shown how high these stakes are because of the interaction of the characters, specifically Cora, the heroine with her children. So let me tell you what this book is about very briefly. So Cora is a widow, a recent widow, and she is a very devoted mother. She has two young children, a boy and a girl. The boy will be the heir to the estate, and she is just throwing herself into motherhood. She loves them so dearly. Her marriage to her husband was very unhappy, it was an arranged marriage. Her father set this marriage up so that she would be taken care of because he knew he was going to die. He thought this would be a very advantageous match. And sweet Cora entered this marriage, you know, with this bloom of youth, all of this hope that this was going to be, you know, maybe it wasn't a love match to begin with, but that it would grow to be a love that she would be happy or that she would at least be happy with this man. She quickly realizes that's not the case as he, you know, is pays her no attention, is very dismissive of her and really only truly sees her as a woman to do her duty by him and provide him with an heir as he ends up having many, many affairs with mistresses, and that's actually one, how he died. So Cora, all of those illusions she had about love and romance are very much dimmed, and she throws herself into raising these two children, playing with them. She's very hands-on, which you don't see in historical romances a lot, and I loved that aspect of her character. Her children are her total world, and she is going to do everything she can to keep them with her, because when her husband died, instead of making her the guardian, he he made his brother the guardian and the brother and the brother's wife are definitely have like nefarious plans for the children and the estate and the finances and they want to take the children away or at least to you know have access to those funds and make Cora not a part of their life anymore so Cora's brother is a barrister and she asks him for help to try and get a case that is convincing enough to convince the courts that she actually is a great mother and um, the children should stay with her. So in order to do that, they come up with this plan that Cora needs a man in her life. She needs a stable, a good man in her life who will be a good father, who will be a good, you know, overseer of the estate that the son will inherit eventually. And Cora can't think of anybody, except for Nate, who she knew before she got married when she was having her coming out years. They did have some sparks, some chemistry, but Nate was a rogue. He was a bit of a scoundrel. Cora actually saved him financially when he got way in over his head with some debts. And she said, hey, you owe me, don't forget. So now here she is all these years later, calling in her debts and asking him to come and pretend to be her fiance to hopefully have enough evidence to convince the courts that she should be able to be the guardian guardian of her children that they should stay with her. And Nate, of course, doesn't really want to do this, but, you know, the reward that she's offering him financially is so overwhelmingly 
needed, but he's like, okay, yeah, I'll do this. And the thing that I really love about this book is, you know, the stakes in the plot, they're very, very high. And they feel high because you you see how she feels about her children. And there are some moments in here that are described where you just can feel that devastation, that fear that these kids might get taken away from her. And she's a bit, little bit hesitant to trust Nate. And she starts to have feelings for him. At first, they're just very, like, physical feelings because she's never really had that opportunity with her husband. You know, he wasn't that type of guy. You know, that type of husband wasn't doing his uh, due diligence there. And she, but she quickly comes to realize that she actually is falling for him and having feelings for him. And Nate, likewise, is doing the same for her. But the thing that really pushes this over the top for me is that he doesn't only fall in love with Cora, but he falls in love with her children. And he finds himself daydreaming and fantasizing about being a dad. He calls them his children in his head. There's a scene in here where he rescues the little girl from a dog and he hears her like call out in fear. And he says out loud, my little little girl needs me and he runs to her. And this is even before like he has admitted feelings to Cora and just the way that he jumped in so ready and willing to be a father to these children and the tenderness. It just, I love this book so much. It, it is so beautifully descriptive of what it feels like to fall in love and that vulnerability, that fear that maybe this isn't going to work out, but you really want to try. It's just perfection. I love it so much and I want everybody to read it. It is on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have a KU subscription, and you love what I've been talking about, please pick this up because it was fantastic. Okay, so now the next two that I have are actually novellas. One of them I read in December, and the other one I read earlier this year because I just fell in love with this author's writing. And the first one I'm going to talk about is A Holiday by Gaslight by Mimi Matthews. I've seen Mimi Matthews around for a while, but I never really heard rave reviews about her, so I wasn't sure, like, how romantic it was. I know she does like closed door romances. I wasn't sure how the romance was going to be. Now, for me personally, a closed door isn't a, isn't a never going to read it. I'm perfectly fine with that if the romance is strong enough and it really is focused on the romance. And so I picked up A Holiday by Gaslight. I recommended by Jessen. Rave reviewed about it. Said it gave her complete North and South vibes. And actually, Mimi Matthews has said that this book is like a love letter to North and South. So if you're a fan of North and South, the BBC show, or the book even, but, you know, specifically the show, Mr. Thornton, uh, you gotta read this. It's fantastic. You don't even need to read it at Christmas time, but it was delightful. I read it at Christmas time. So this is basically about Sophie. She needs to marry to help her family's financial status, like they're kind of struggling, and she's willing to marry outside of her station in order to do that. So a man who has been like pursuing her and courting her, his name is Mr. Edward Sharp. He is a very successful merchant, a made man, if you were, so outside of her social class, but you know, he has the funds. But she doesn't really feel any connection with him. She doesn't feel any like romance or anything. So she's ready to just sort of like push him aside. Meanwhile, Mr. Thornton, who is like closed off all business, not Mr. Thornton. I mean, he is a Mr. Thornton, but Mr. Sharp, Mr. Edward Sharp, he's very cold, closed off, stoic, doesn't let his emotions show. Meanwhile, he has a lot of feelings for her. He just doesn't really do a great job of showing it. And so she gives him one more chance at a dinner at a ball to see if, he, you know, if she can actually tell if he has feelings for her. And it just was a pure delight. I love this little novella so much. It's so enjoyable. This is going to be a reread for me every Christmas. Honestly, I kind of want to reread it right now because I am doing a rewatch of North and South at the moment. But I loved it. It was deeply romantic. A very stoic hero who you know, the heroine is like, well, you don't even like me. And, and, you know, internally, he's like madly in love with her. It's the best thing ever. So now another novella by Mimi Matthews, which was a five star read for me is The Lost Letter. Now this is actually Mimi's debut. And I was deeply impressed with this. I thought, you know, her writing is top tier. She's really excellent writer, very clear, very concise, but also very emotional, very evocative of the feelings that her characters are going through. She does a really good job of portraying that. So I was very pleasantly surprised to see her writing was like top tier in this book, but also the romance, the plot, the setup, everything about this really, really worked for me. The basic premise is we have our heroine who name is Sylvia and our hero Conrad. Sylvia finds herself really down on her luck. Her, her father recently killed himself because he was in such dire financial straits, leaving Sylvia just absolutely destitute. She has no money, so she has to go and find a job. So she finds herself working as a governess, supporting herself, but you know, 
she's no longer in like the social elite. Her standing has completely gone because she had to go out and work for a living. And when she, before her father died, she had a budding romance with a man named Conrad. And they both had a lot of strong feelings for one another. And he ended up leaving to go to the war. And there was a letter that she wrote him where she was telling him how she felt about him because he didn't know before he left for the war. The letter ends up getting lost. He comes back from the war. Conrad does scarred, damaged, damaged physically, but also like really internally, you know, as the scars affect him, he feels like people find him disgusting, repulsive, a bit of a Beauty and the Beast vibes with this book. And he's struggling, you know, he's a very damaged hero. And he believes that Sophie didn't love him, that, you know, she didn't actually end up writing a letter, that all of the the signs she was giving him were false, and that he like, she like played him, basically. So, Conrad's sister asks Sophie to come and take care of him, basically, and she offers her enough pay to make it worth her while, so Sophie does, and they have a couple of run-ins where he's, like, very cold and almost cruel to her and mean, and she's like, what is going on? You know, like, her feelings are hurt because she believed he got her letter, and so she's like, he doesn't love me because I expressed my feelings to him, and he's like, she never said how she felt about me, and it's just this, a classic case of miscommunication, but I felt like it was handled so well, and once you get to read the letter, the epistolary aspect of it is just fantastic, and I loved this book. It was very romantic. If you liked A Holiday by Gaslight, I think you will also really love this one. Even though it's not like North and South, it's still like excellent Victorian romance. I really, really loved it. Okay, now we're going to talk about The Wolf and the Wildflower. This book was just such a delight. I loved this book so much. Stacey Reed never disappoints, but this book kind of blew my mind. So in this book, we have James, who is the Duke, and he has been missing for a decade. He's believed to have been lost at sea, but meanwhile, he's been living in the wilderness, surviving with wolves and things like that. Like, he survived. He finally comes back into town. His mother is the Duchess, and she's like, you need to be ready to meet the Queen in three weeks or our social standing is going to plummet, and we can't have that, you know? So the queen calls in the help of Jules and her father. Jules' father is a psychiatrist, and the, the duchess believes that he will be able to help her son, you know, be able to talk again, be able to function normally, because, uh, you know, he's got such a grasp on human nature and things like that. So Jules is the son of the psychologist, and she has been presenting as a man her entire life. Her father believes her to be a boy. Circumstances regarding her birth and her mother, it's complicated, but I'm not going to spoil that for you. You'll find that out in the first chapter in this book. So Jules goes to help her father. On the first meeting with the Duke, James, the Duke-to-be, he sees something is different about Jules. He's not convinced with her portrayal that she is a man. He feels this draw to her that is part chemical and part emotional, and she feels the same with him. And they end up really coming together and having this relationship, this romance that develops slowly enough, but just unravels with this powerful force of these two people are like soulmates, like meant to be together. And I just love it so much. It's delicious. It's romantic. It's bonkers in the most fantastic way. I loved this book so much. Okay, so now the last book I want to talk about is The Duke Gets Even. This is Joanna Shoup's new release. I think this came out in January or something like that. I had an arc of this book and I was so excited about it, but I was also so nervous because not every book in this series has been a hit for me. The Lady Gets Lucky, I think, is definitely the highlight of the series. Love that book so freaking much forever and always. But The Duke Gets Even, I absolutely adored. So this is finally The Duke of Lockwood. The Duke of Lockwood finally gets his book, and we finally get to see who he chooses to be his new duchess. So this book opens with a bang. When the Duke of Lockwood is at the beach, he is waiting for someone he's going to have a supposed midnight tryst with. But who does he see out in the ocean having a midnight swim, unclothed, but Nellie. Nellie, who has deliberately gone and had herself ruined, her reputation ruined, so that she could, in her mind, she thinks, have more freedom than she's currently having. Her father is very wealthy and, you know, sees no problem with this, doesn't want to rein Nellie in at all, so he kind of lets her do whatever she wants to do. And the Duke and Nellie have an interaction in the ocean that is absolutely very typical of the spicy Joanna Shoup that I really, really adored. And then throughout the rest of the book, we get to see the Duke of Lockwood try and figure out, you know, he's got these feelings for Nellie, he feels drawn towards her, but 
her reputation's ruined and he needs a wife who is not only going to, you know, supply his coffers because he's a little broke, but also somebody who's going to not tarnish his reputation. And so he feels that struggle of wanting Nellie, but also realizing she's not really a match for him. Nellie, on the mean, <laughs> on the other hand, doesn't want to get married, you know, but she finds herself conflicted again with feelings for the Duke. And it was just really beautiful. I really, really loved this one. I adore Joanna Shoup and I think that this is another great one. If you like her writing, you'll probably really love this. And I also really loved the ending because the heroine had to grovel and I just loved it. I felt like this couple was just a perfect match. I liked the complexity of their relationship. I liked how nothing was easy. And I also did enjoy how Nellie sort of like pushed against him and didn't want to do that. And he meanwhile, you know, pushed against the the ideas that he had for what a, what a wife would look like for a perfect wife for him and he went out of his way once he decided he wanted Nellie nothing was going to stop him and I just I loved it I thought it was a great time and I just I mean the cover is stunning it was just great so I was really happy with this one and I can't wait to see what Joanna Shoup writes next so all right, my friends, there you have it. Those are some of my favorite historical romances that I've read recently. Hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you wanna leave me an emoji and uh, let me know you were here, please feel free to leave me a unicorn emoji and I'll see y'all in my next video.